a wonderful privilege for us to gather together with such a, a reason to learn more about our wonderful Jesus, which is the Messiah in the sanctuary, as we learn. We have learned many things, thank you. We have learned many things about, uh, starting with uh, uh, yesterday evening, when we started, yeah? We have seen that there is a controversy in the sanctuary. We study also about the feast in the sanctuary. We have heard in this morning the message that Brother uh, Henry Dering brought. We have heard that also Jesus is our, is also our judge and is also our advocate in the sanctuary. Today, so right now we will learn a few things about the sanctuary in detail, as you see on this screen. Uh, of course, when uh, I prepare this uh, subject, uh, we have heard uh, previous from our youth that almost every detail it was explained, but we'll go more deeply to see with our Bibles. Uh, we'll um, uh, try to find uh, the meaning of each item in the sanctuary and apply to our spiritual life. Let's start with some good news. Because many people, when we talk about the Old Testament, they say, well, Old Testament, it was fulfilled, so we don't need to so give too much attention to the Old Testament. We just studied the New Testament. But you know what? I found in the, New, in the Old Testament that there is a gospel. The good news, the glad tidings, we found in the, this specific gospel that we'll go through, which is the sanctuary. And let's start with some wonderful news. God loves us. He loves us so much that he wants us to be with him. It's like when we see our friends, uh, we like to invite them to our place and say, why don't you come and stay uh, with us one week, two weeks, I have a spare bedroom, so please come and live and stay with us. And we like to do that. But God loves us so much that he has a special request. It's not like when you go to your friends and, and, and leave, for example, I live to, to at Brother Timo's place. When I call him, he said, come because I have a spare bedroom for you. But that's not like a permanent request, come and live with me. This is the way God feels. And he will not be happy until we will be living with him in the paradise. You remember when Jesus was about, uh, about to, to, to go to his father from the place where he came? He gave to the disciples a wonderful promise. In John 14, verses 1 to 3, we read, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, Jesus says, I will come again that and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's a wonderful promise. And we should be the most happiest people in the world because we have such a wonderful father and such a wonderful savior that he went to prepare a place for us. As many times I mentioned, he didn't go there to build houses for us. He went there to continue the work where he left on this earth. And many times we ask the questions, why are we not in heaven today? If God loves us so much, if Jesus has promised this, why are we not in heaven today? Why has Jesus not yet returned as he promised? Could it be a problem the distance? We don't think so, because we remember that Jesus spent seven days, the, the seven creation days, on this planet Earth. Could it be uh, he not only spent those days, but he visited Adam and Eve? 
He visited the old Abraham and ate with him in his tent. He talked with Moses on Mount Sinai. And for 40 years, in their journey through the wilderness, we remember that in a cloud during the day, God's people were protected. In a cloud of fire during the night. Also, we know from the scriptures that Jesus came as a baby. He was born in Bethlehem, but he was brought up in Nazareth. And he lived with men for 33 years. He gave his life. He paid the debt which we never would be able to pay. We just heard in this morning in the sermon. And the Bible speaks about that we were bought not with money, not with silver and gold, but with the precious blood of the Son of God. Keeping this in our mind, let's go through all these things. The time, could it be a problem of the time? When we read in Matthew chapter 24, we read that almost all the signs, they were fulfilled. Do you know from more than 16, which I counted, I found that there is only one missing. And do you know which is missing is Jesus' second coming. What then is the problem? Why hasn't Christ yet come? God has a problem. And the sanctuary is all about how to take away sin. How can he save God? How can he save the sinner without saving the sin? This is God's problem, and in the sanctuary system and services, we will learn how God is doing that. Many people, they think, and preachers, they say, we have the solution to God's problem. They think that they have the answer to God's problem. Ellen White is a very well uh, writer, very well known writer. She wrote something very interesting for us, for those of us that we know what the spirit of prophecy speaks about. This goody-goody religion that makes light of sin and that is forever dwelling upon the love of God to the sinner encourages the sinner to believe that God will save him while he continues in sin and he knows it to be sin. She speaks about Christians here. She speaks about us. Because the next, look what says. This is the way that many are doing who profess to believe the present truth. The truth is, and look the consequences right now, what happened when this is like those indulgent parents who say, I don't need to correct those mistakes in my son because one day he will grow up and he will behave the other way or in some other way. But that's not so. Because look, look what the, the servant of the Lord is saying farther on. The truth is kept apart from their life and this is the reason it has no more power to convict and convert what? And convert the soul. Uh, without conversion. Without repentance. All the sanctuary is in vain. Because we know and we will see what was required for a penitent sinner in order to be forgiven. And the sanctuary is the plan of salvation. And the sanctuary teaches us a wonderful lesson. In fact, the servant of the Lord says that is the basis of our foundation. Without having knowledge about the sanctuary and the meaning and its application in our spiritual life, we cannot understand how God can get rid of sin, but not getting rid of, of you and me. And this is the way we will learn together. First of all, it's in two parts my presentation. First of all, we go to the Bible text in the scriptures. I remember as I sat like you in, in, in my classroom and, and Sister Raquel was teaching us ours. Um, it was just after three months after my conversion, I end up in the missionary school. And uh, there I didn't have any knowledge about the sanctuary. Only I knew that I was forgiven. And I was listening and listening and listening and all six hours 
taking notes. So I invite you to take a paper because we don't have such a memory that we can remember every text. And whatever you see there, and you can take benefit from those Bible texts and read, just do like those people in Berea, in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, says that they were more minded. They went home and they checked what Paul was speaking about. And in this sanctuary, we will learn the way how God deals with your problem and my problem. We will learn how God helps us to get rid of our sins and to have a life, such a life that will bring amazement to all heaven that we can live a perfect life. For this Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14, verse 6. There is a psalm, and it's very interesting. And in 77, verse 13, it was quoted by Brother Morris yesterday evening. But I would like to bring something more to this Bible text, because this psalm was written particularly by Asaph. I was thinking that David wrote it, but it's Asaph. And Asaph was one of the writers. He was a singer at the temple in the time of David, and he wrote many psalms. But what I want to bring uh, into our attention is that he couldn't understand why the boastful, why the pride, why the people that they were not from God's people prosper in their life. And he said, what's the benefit, Lord? Look, if they prosper, what happened with, with us? And look what the Bible says. I don't have that Bible text, but I will read it. Because now he mentioned when he was able to see the end or to understand that is in Psalm 73 verse 17 look what he said until I went into the sanctuary of God then I understood their end so he was appointed toward the sanctuary of God in order to understand that there is an end for the wicked ones and there is a reward for the ones that serve the Lord. I would like to quote those Bible texts from Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, regarding the ministration of our Lord Jesus and that, that there was also a sanctuary in heaven and the one that was made on earth was just a miniature. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. Paul said, this is the conclusion of everything, of all my preachers, or my preachings. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. This is the main point. When I heard the first time that I have a high priest, I say, why do I need a priest, a, a, a earthly priest, mom, if we have a high priest? Why do I need to confess my sins to a man while I have a personal savior who can take care of my problems, my burdens, and can give me or release me from this, uh, from this burden? It's very interesting when you look at the sanctuary you see that there was a wall. We heard in this uh, afternoon, the presentation, beautiful presentation of the youth, that that fence, it was made with, uh, with, with, with one purpose, a special purpose. People that they have to come with the lamb sacrifice to the, to the sanctuary, they couldn't just find another door. They couldn't see over that wall. So people from outside, they couldn't see the beauty of the services that were performed inside of this tabernacle or sanctuary. Uh, this sanctuary, earthly sanctuary, we know that was built by Moses in his time, 1445 BC the first time, approximately. And it was uh, so specific. God gave him direction so specifically 
And many times you read in, in, in Exodus that God repeats, take care that everything should or must be done according to what I have shown to you. Don't add anything. Don't take out anything. Because it's symbol, it's so important for your salvation. So let's start the journey and have, let's see how we can reach to that beautiful structure that was commanded by God and made by Moses in his time. The first, first of all, the sanctuary teaches us three very important things. First of all, we have the court ear where we find the two elements, the two items. It was the altar, the, uh, the altar of sacrifices and the labor. That is where the substitution or the one that needed to die in my place that took place, the lamb, I mean the innocent lamb. Then we go into the holy place. We find three items. And then we have, I will talk more about uh, Further on, And then we have the most holy place where the judgment, as we heard in our message in this morning, takes place. And it's very important, important in our spiritual life because these three steps must happen in our lives. Yeah, it was necessary that someone should die in my stead. Yes, it was in the time of Moses, a lamb, that lamb, that innocent lamb, took the sins in a symbolical way over himself or itself. In the courtyard took place the justification just. In the holy place takes place the sanctification. And the most holy place is the glorification. When Christ comes, we will be glorified. So first of all, we will talk about the door. So I invite you to take your Bible and let's grow this journey Christ said in John chapter 10 verse 9 I am the door by me if any man enter in he shall be what he shall be saved you see we have many other several Bible texts that says for example in Acts chapter 4 verse 12 there is no other name given to us in which we must be saved except Jesus Christ if you go to 1 Timothy I don't have them there, but I remember them. First Timothy uh, chapter 5, verse 2. There is only one God and one what? Mediator. One God, one mediator. The only way to God is through Christ. The only door. The courtier. It had about 75 feet wide and 100, 150 feet long. It was made of linen, white, which is, you know, what represents the, justifi the justification, the purity of Christ. The altar of burnt offerings. Immediately upon entering the door of the court here sat the brazen altar of burnt offerings. The altar was a hollow box, five cubits square and three cubits high, made of boards of acacia wood. There was a horn of the same wood on each corner. Four corners, we find four horns. A network of brass in the center held the fire and gave draft for it and allowed it, the ashes to fall beneath. The entire altar with the horns was all overlaid with brass. You can find that in Exodus chapter 27, verses 1 through 8. Let's go to the labor. That's only a description, a biblical description. But then we'll go into each element and see the application, the spiritual application of it. So if I'm speaking a little bit so fast, it's just because of our time. I remember this, and I will try to make it short that we can take a message with us. Because I tell you, it's a wonderful lesson, what we find in the sanctuary. I tell you from my personal experience with the sanctuary, it's a beautiful lesson. It's all the plan of salvation is in there. It's everything what happened to Christ. And you'll see that not only on this earth, then we are able to know what he is doing right now in heaven. So once again, I would like to raise your interest in this and think of the benefit we can have 
from this lesson. Many people, they don't know. They said, well, sanctuary, time of Moses. It was animal sacrifices, but they don't think how important it is. And you'll see, you'll remain amazed what we'll learn from the three pieces of furniture in just the most holy place. Because many people, they go to the, to the altar of, of, burn, uh, of, of the sacrifices, they go to the labor, they are baptized, they receive Jesus as their personal savior, and they remain there. No more growth in our Christian life. And to grow, you should enter into the holy place. When you go through the holy place, you, go to the, you are prepared to go into the most holy place, which is the last step. So the labor between the altar of burnt offerings and the tabernacle itself to the labor. It was also made of brass and was filled with water for the cleansing of the priest. That brass, that, that uh, mirrors that were given us uh, free offerings, gifts there at the tabernacle when, when God said, uh, told Moses, don't bring any, anything more. The people, they were willing to give all those stuffs they have in order to make the wonderful tabernacle, just as God commanded Moses. The golden lampstand. Just inside the holy place of the left south side stood the golden menorah that had seven candlestick branches. You find that written in Exodus chapter 25, verses 31 to 40. They were not wax candles as we know them, so, but lamps fueled by pure olive oil. The priest trimmed the wicks daily and refilled the bowls with oil so that the menorah would constantly be a source of light for the holy place. In fact, it was the only light in the old tabernacle. And the gold, the pillars that they were overlaid with gold, I read it, 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 it was so important when the priest entered, I mean the, the, the common priest, because they are enter all, all the priests in the, in the holy place, but in the most holy place, just the high priest. But there, when they entered, they saw themselves in that, in that golden, uh, 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 in those pillars that they were overlaid with golden and silver, they saw themselves, and that was a lesson for them to see that the eyes of the Lord is upon them. The tables of showbread. Opposite the lamp was the table of showbread on the north side. Yeah, As you enter in the right side, that would be the north. You remember also that the structure of the sanctuary was from the east to the west. It was a, a reason, a specific reason for that, that they may worship not the sun with their faces toward the sun, but with their back may stay on the sun and their faces toward the the presence of the Lord toward the west. On it were kept 12 loaves of unleavened bread. That you may read in Leviticus chapter 24, verses 5 through 9. The altar of incense. The altar of incense was located directly across from the door, standing against the ornate veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. Like several other items in the sanctuary, it was also made of acacia wood, and covered with gold, Exodus chapter 30, verses 1 through 3. The Ark of the Covenant, we, we finish now with the, with the holy place. We go into the most holy place, the most sacred place. It was not allowed to enter any time when you want to say, I, I, just go to, I, I just want to go there. No, no, just once, one, once in a year. Inside the most holy place, or holy of holies, was one piece of furniture, the Ark of the Covenant. This sacred box, also constructed of acacia wood and covered with gold, contained the tables of stone upon which God had written the Ten Commandments. It also contained Aaron's rod that had budded and a small pot of manna. The lid of the Ark was called the Mercy Seat, Exodus 25, 17, and above it, was the shining glory of the Lord, or Shekinah, which literally means the dwelling, radiating between two covering cherubs, or angels on either end of the ark. We have learned as well that there in between the two cherubims was manifested the presence of the Lord in a cloud. The cherubims, and I believe, according to the scriptures, uh, Satan was in, I mean, uh, Lucifer, 
uh, was in the most intimate presence of the Lord. He had the privilege to be there where the Most High was. And we heard about that in, in the sermon of Brother Morris, that he wasn't, con he wasn't happy with that. He wanted to be worshipped like God. He wanted to be God himself. When Adam and Eve sinned, but before, well, after, when they sinned, we know that God made for them tunics. In chapter 3 is the, let me say, it's sad because there we find sin, how sin entered into the world. But it's also uh, a great joy for us as Christians because there we find the first promise. In chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 15, we find that God said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Between thy seed and her seed. So anytime when someone repents, God places enmity against sin in our hearts. If we love sin, that's the proof that we are not converted. So when Adam and Eve, so God sacrificed the first lamb. That's why the Bible text said that God loves so much the world that he gave Sacrificing that animal, God himself knew that his son would have to die for our sins. So there in the garden was Adam and Eve. They were taught a lesson because of their transgressions, they would have to die. But not themselves, an animal representing Jesus Christ. So Adam and Eve, they taught their children as we do with our children. They taught about sacrifices. So Abel and Cain, they were taught how to do that. And Abel obeyed the Lord, and he brought a sacrifice, a lamb, where blood was out, because we know that the life is in the blood, according to Leviticus chapter 11, I think. And down through the century, from the time of Abel, of Adam, until the time of Christ, they were taught, they were coming to have a sacrifice, and they were worshiping God, looking forward for the day when Christ would have to come. Jesus came, and all of those symbols, they were fulfilled in his life at the cross. He was the lamb. John, in chapter 1, verse 29, says, Behold, John the Baptist, looking at the innocent, they never knew each other. John the Baptist was six months, according to the Bible, biblical record, older than Jesus. But when he saw Jesus coming at the river, <laughs> he fell down. And he said, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to be baptized by me. And Jesus said, let it be fulfilled what was spoken of. But can you imagine? Amen. They were cousins, yeah? They never knew each other. But when he saw Jesus, he recognizes Jesus as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. I may say, your sins and my sin. And there at the cross, people looking at him down through the centuries, he was and he is the Lamb that taketh away the sin of the world. Let's go now to see the spiritual application. The altar of burnt offerings, we take it again now. And we have the type in the Old Testament and we have in the New Testament or biblical references that speaks about these specific things. So there was a court surrounding the tabernacle in which the offerings were slain. We read it that in Exodus 27. But in John chapter 12, we read about Christ that the great antitypical offering was slain where? In the earth, on this planet. Now it's interesting what happens with the ashes because the priest has to do something with the ashes. The ashes from the altar were placed in a clean place. And do you know what I read about ashes? God wanted to impress the children. The children, when they went to the sanctuary, they were impressed by the fact that there were ashes put in a place, in a clean place, and they would ask their father, their mother, what, what is all this about? to show them or to teach them a lesson how ugly is sin, because ashes represents sins. 
our confessed sins and forsaken sins and those who are put and at the end will be put over the head of, uh, of Azazel, which is a symbol of Satan. In Malachi, Malachi uh, chapter 4 said, the ashes of the wicked will be left on the clean earth because the earth will be uh, clean by fire. Leviticus 6, 10, the priest was attired in priestly garments when he placed the ashes by the altar. And look what happens with Christ. In Hebrews we read 2, 17, that Christ is the high priest to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. In Leviticus 6, 11, when the priest carried the ashes without a camp and to a clean place, he laid aside his priestly robes. What kind of robe do Jesus wear right now? He's what? He's priestly. What robes will he wear when he will come the second time? King. In Revelation 19, we read about Christ. When Christ comes to the earth to destroy sin and sinners, he will have changed his priestly garments for those of a, of a king. The labor. The picture of sinners' justification became clear in the court year. Before God gave the Israelites his law on tables of stone, he saved them from the slavery in Egypt by virtue of their faith in the Passover lamb, symbolized by the altar, and baptized them in the sea. Do you remember? They were slaves for 400 years. God remembered them because they were crying day and night. Their lives became so burdened, they didn't want to live in that condition anymore. And they cried unto the Lord. And the Bible tells us that the Lord hears his people. And then he sent Moses to save them. Represented by the labor, God takes us just as we are and forgives our sins. When we accept Christ, confess our sins, and ask for forgiveness, our heavenly record of sin is covered by Jesus' blood. You remember Brother Daring mentioned today that wonderful Bible text in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess, if our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive all our sins. Verse 7, if we have fellowship with one another. Fellowship, it doesn't mean just to take your Bible, come to the church and look at others like this. Fellowship in the, what the Bible meant, what, what God wants to tell us is when we love our brother and when, when we are willing to give our lives for someone. When we love in spite of, or, or when we have unconditional love for those people, just as we have for our sons. Sometimes I said, I have to bear this so many times. How many times, Edward, I have to bear with that? And I think how many times God does with me. And then I, I have to bow my head and say, Lord, and I'm thinking, the way he treats me is the way I treat God. The way our children treat us, or treat us, many times it's come in turns that we may learn a lesson. And if we don't learn it, when it's at our stake and we can learn something, we can learn. And the, the spiritual prophecy said that what we didn't fulfill in this uh, mission, or what we have to do now, we will learn in, 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 in difficult circumstances. The baptism Jesus received wasn't because he was a sinner. It was because he wanted to give us an example that we have to go through the water of baptism. Any person, I'm so happy and I encourage uh, those faithful people that take the stand to, 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 to receive the, the biblical baptism, to start the journey with, with God, it's not, you know, it's not the end. It's just the beginning. And I would like to encourage you, in terms of your salvation, you have done the best election of your life, ever. If you want to have a happy marriage, if you want to have a happy future in this life, make your first decision, receive Christ. Don't marry and then say, maybe I will find Jesus after. I have someone that told me like this. I don't give names. Someone very close to me and said, 
Nicholas, just let me to, to marry first. I gave Bible study from the missionary school. I didn't have so much knowledge at that time. I told you it was just the beginning of my, it was the first step. I said, now I'm saved. Everything was done. And I gave Bible study to that person. And when it was to go to the, to the, to the baptism, she said, no. And now she said, I would have to do that at that time. The golden lampstand. John, the beloved disciple of Christ, had a vision. In chapter 4, you remember, God told him, come up, come up here. An open door. He saw Jesus just as it was where the, the, the high priest in his garments. He saw Jesus among the candlestick, the seven candlestick, having seven stars in his right hand, which are the angels or God's messengers. When you are doing God's will, when you are a church leader, don't think that you are on your own. Don't think of the burden which is placed upon you because now you will say, how can I do that? Jesus is, the, is taking care of us. He has us in his right hand. Angel, in the Bible, it means messenger. And you and I are God's messengers. According to Peter, it says that we are a holy nation, a holy priesthood. And as priests, we have to offer sacrifices unto God. And the sacrifices that he wants to take from us is not a lamb, is a broken spirit. It's a humble spirit. Exodus chapter 40, verse 24. Golden candlestick in the first apartment of earthly sanctuary. Revelation 1, 12, we read in the Bible, John saw the seven golden candlesticks in heaven. Exodus 25, there were seven lamps upon the candlestick. John saw the seven golden candlesticks in heaven. The high priest, it was his mission, not the common priest, just the high priest. to trim and lighten the lamps in the earthly sanctuary. Why? Because John saw Christ, our high priest, in the midst of the candlestick in heaven. The lamps were burned continually, always shedding forth light. The Holy Spirit lightens every soul that comes into the world, whether he accepts or rejects it. You remember that particular text in John chapter 1, verse 11. Christ came to his own, and his, his own received him not. But verse 12 says that to those who received him, he gave them the right to be called what? The sons and daughters of God. You see, we are reconciled to God through his sacrifice. Jesus is the one that takes care of our church. Even if we bear responsibilities, he is doing through us. He is leading us if we just want to be led by, by, by the Spirit of God, we'll be in touch with the right people, we'll do the work that God appointed for us, and we'll feel, fulfill the mission that God has given to us. The table of showbread. So all of these three elements that we'll study, the candlestick, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense, teach us three things. The bread symbolizes what? What said Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So we don't live only by, yes, it's true, we are nourished by the physical food we receive from the fruits, vegetables, and what we eat. But the spiritual bread, which is the word of God, is the most important. Just as you cannot live Without the physical food, we cannot grow without studying the Word of God. And those things which we learn from the table of showbread, from the candlestick and the altar of incense is that we study the Word of God. When we study the Word of God, what we have? We have a life of prayer. We like to pray. When we have a life of prayer and we realize that we were lost, but we were found, we go to witness. And this is what the lampstand stands for. To go to witness. 
The table of showbread was placed on the north side of the first apartment of the sanctuary. The table was two cubits long, a cubit long and an half in width, and a cubit and an half in height. It was overlaid with pure gold and like the altar of incense was ornamented with a crown of gold around the top. On the Sabbath day, the Levites made 12 loaves of cakes of unleavened bread. Do you know, this is a Sabbath. If we go back in that time, today, according to this, the priests, they had to do these loaves of bread, 12. And they were left during the week. And do you know when they were eaten? Next Sabbath. Can you imagine how, how hard that bread should be? It was eaten by whom? Only by the priest. Was not allowed. Although we have the story of David, that's something else. And it was an exception. Jesus mentioned the story of David, how he went into the sanctuary and there was no bread except the bread which was in the presence of the Lord. And they ate that bread without dying. But it was allowed just for the priest to eat it. It means that during the week, we have to study the word of God. And we have to study to ourselves. And then to go to witness, to go to give a Bible study to someone else. These cakes were placed on the table hot each Sabbath day. Arranged in two piles, six in a row, with pure fran... How do you spell that? How do you pronounce that word? How? Frank Frankies? Frankincense. Frankincense. Thank you. Frankincense. I don't want to say something wrong. Although maybe I said many words. Uh, on each row. During the entire week, the bread lay on the table. By some translators, it is called the bread of the presence. And the end of the week, it was removed and eaten by the priest. Levitic, you may read that in Leviticus 24, verse 9. Showbread always before the Lord. Christ said, I am the bread of life. Leviticus 25 said, there were 12 cakes of the showbread, the number of the tribes of Israel. And 1 Corinthians, Paul said in chapter 10, verse 17, in speaking of the church, Paul says, we being many are one bread on one body. The altar of incense. The golden altar or altar of incense was before the veil in the first apartment of the sanctuary. It was a cubit square and two cubits high with a horn upon each corner, just like the, the other altar, you remember. And with a horn upon each corner, around the top was a beautiful crown of gold, and beneath the crown were rings in which were stays for carrying the altar, all overlaid with pure gold. Within the crown of gold, encircling the top of the altar, Holy fire was kept constantly burning, from which ascended the fragrant smoke of the incense playing upon it. Every morning and evening, the incense was very sacred. Do you think it was allowed for someone to do it? Even the ingredients. They had to use a certain quantity and, a, and, and, and something very special to do that incense. If it was done otherwise, that would be killed, cut off. Look what says, and the person making any like it, even for a perfume, was to be cut off from among the people. You read that in Exodus 13, the Bible you read. The high priest alone was to perform the sacred duty of placing incense before the Lord on the golden altar. And we have the, uh, the type and the anti-type. There is a golden altar in heaven before the throne of God. Revelation 8, 8 we read that in verse three. Incense was born on the golden altar, so much incense is added to the prayers of all saints, and then they ascend before God, and we have also the one who should burn incense with strange fire was to be destroyed. And I, Isaiah 64, verse 6, one clothed with his own righteousness, what will happen with him at the end? Will be what? Destroyed. So the Ark of the Covenant, we go into the most holy place, the most sacred place, where the very presence of God was among the two cherubims. The broken law containing the ark was the only reason for all the sacrificial services, both typical and antitypical. When the Lord gave directions for making the sanctuary, his first instruction, look, be, be, before saying something else, the other items God said about the ark, this. 
His first instruction was, they shall make an ark of shittim, acacia wood, two cubits and an half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And you read that in Exodus 25, verse 10. It was overlaid within and without with pure gold, with a crown of gold around the top. That was called the mercy seat. The cover of the ark was called the mercy seat and was of pure gold. On either end of the mercy seat were cherubim of beaten gold with their wings stretched forth, covering the ark and their faces looking reverently to, toward the love of God contained there, therein. In that box was the broken law, which says the wages of sin is death. The sinner must die. But the gift of God is eternal life. God is justice. We heard that at the cross, David says that, at the cross, he's what? Righteousness and the justice of God were kissed at the cross. Christ came to fulfill that and to pay for our sins. The ark was placed in the most holy place and in Revelation 11, we find the ark was seen in the heavenly sanctuary. We find God's visible presence was manifested above the mercy seat and the Lord gives his name as merciful and gracious and long suffering. It was told to Moses when he wanted to see the glory of God, he couldn't because no man can see God and live. But God told him what he is all about, merciful, gracious, and long suffering. That broken law, and not only that, inside of the ark was also the pot of manna, which is the health reform, is the manna that the Israelites, they lived with for 40 years, and it was also the Aaron's rod which budded, and that's the orga organization. God's church is organized. God's people, they are well organized, and they do a great mission when they are very well organized. We know that God is not confusion. So no, because we went into the most holy place, I would like to talk a little bit about the two kinds of ministry that was. And we know the daily, which was tamid continually or daily, a lamb each morning and evening was uh, killed, sacri sacrificed. And we have the yearly or Yom Kippur, which means was the atonement day or the covering day. You have two chapters to read about in Leviticus chapter 16 and Leviticus chapter 23, we read about this. The daily ministry included a sacrifice for sin, singular, twice a day, morning and afternoon. But the yearly ministry, once a year, the sanctuary was cleansed from the record of people's sins. And that was called the Day of Atonement. Yom Kippur, the Day of Judgment. And look who was benefited from this only. Only those who had brought their sin to the Lord could be cleansed by the Lord. So it means that if we don't confess our sins, if we don't believe that there is taking place a judgment right now, then there is not needed of repentance and the judgment day just go or pass and our names will be taken from that record or it will be there for life or for death. The cleansing of the sanctuary represented the final judgment. I'm, I'm very close to close that. The final judgment or exoneration for sinners of the sinners for their sin. Since 1844, we have heard today, God's church has lived in the time of judgment. This is God's judgment hour. Today is the time of judgment. Today is the time for cleansing. And I appeal to you. It's not just my appeal. God appeals to you to reconcile to God today. Tomorrow you don't know. We have many examples in the Bible. When you read in Acts chapter 24, verse 25, it says about someone which was called Felix. Paul was brought before him. He had a Jewish wife. And the wife was a godly woman. She knew. Maybe she told him about. But when Paul was brought before Felix, and he heard about the judgment, about the righteousness, 
He said, go away from me. When I will find a convenient time, I will call for you. They didn't have cell phone in that time. Maybe it would be easier. But the record is that he never called him back. It means that Felix died in his sin. And it can be a lesson for us if we don't take it. I would rather prefer to give my life today to Christ and say, Lord, I have done wrong. I'm a sinner. I recognize that. I would like to take my life, take my heart, fill it with your Holy Spirit, and help me to know what to do next. We have done missionary work in the neighborhood. We have done our research. And I have seen from this that many people, they just abstain and just give back. I'm not a sinner. I'm not so bad. I'm not so bad. I have my best friend, says Nicholas. I went very soon to Romania with my family. We spent three weeks there. I visited some of my friends and said, Nicholas, you know I'm a very good man. He works in his shop there, and I don't steal, I don't kill, I don't commit adultery. I don't do anything. Why should I repent of something which I haven't done? And I said, you know what? That was my thought before. I said, I'm a good man, although I did wrong to my family, to my grandmother. And you know, one day I realized that without Christ I'm lost. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, read it. No one is just. Verse 10, verse 23, you find no one righteous on the earth. All have done evil and have all of the glory of God. From the beginning, sacrifices were meant to help people understand the high cost of salvation. In the Old Testament, the death of sacrificial lambs symbolizes the Lamb of God. From Adam, Noah, Abraham, da David, Daniel, and we come to the cross. At the cross, the ceremonial system of sacrifices came to an end. In 2 Corinthians, when we read this Bible text, read it carefully until you will understand the meaning. What, look what happened here. In verse five, in chapter 5, verse 21. For he, God, made him Christ, his son, who knew no sin to be what for us? To be sin. What? To be? To be sin for us. What does it mean? He became for me, he, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for me, to take my sins away. And look why. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. When we think of these words, they, are, they have so much value. They tell us all about the plan of salvation, how much God gave for us. You can have forgiveness by accepting Jesus' sacrifice for you. I would like to, my, to make special appeal to you. The wages of sin is dead, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. It would stop just there. The wages of sin is dead. That's very sad news. But in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, we read that the gift of God is eternal life. If we receive that gift, as Brother Daring made an appeal today, if you receive the check, it's valid. If not, it doesn't have any value for you. Christ is your advocate and judge. You can have abundant life by accepting Jesus' life in you today. Christ paid with his death and gives you his life. What will you do? I would like to see and to make sure that any one of us will understand the plan of salvation in the sanctuary. Every detail. It is so important. It's utmost important for us. And in order to understand that Christ through his death, paid and gave us the right to have eternal life. Take your Bible with me, please, and let's read something in John chapter 17. We read it together. I don't have in that. And I would like to make a special appeal, because here Christ is making a, a, a special appeal to God for those who God gave him to him. And look in chapter 17. is the prayer of Christ. And if you feel called, just raise your hand if you want to. I know maybe in the past you have done your commitment to the Lord. You gave your life to the Lord. You are baptized. You are a church member. Maybe you are on the way. Maybe some of you drifted away from Christ. And now he gives you 
the opportunity to, to renew your covenant with him, to take it seriously. Look what Christ prayed for in his prayer in John chapter 17. It says from verse 6, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you, for I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them. If you receive the word of God, if you just take it personally, the Bible said, and have known surely that I, I came forth from you and they have believed that you sent me. If you believe. I pray for them, said Jesus in verse 9. I do not pray for the world. Jesus is praying for you and for me. He's praying for those who hear those words. So I would like just by raising your hand that you want a new life in Christ. Although you have consecrated your love to Christ, I would like that see few hands that wants to say, yes, Lord, I would like to give my life back to you because you gave so much for me. And further, he said, not only, I do not pray for those alone, but also, in verse 20, for those who will believe in me through their words. It means that any time when we come here and we talk in Jesus' name and you hear, you, you listen, the appeals that are done by the minister or by someone that comes here are not our appeals, but God wants us to see that we want to follow him. So I would like to close here and to thank you for your attention and just to pray to the Lord that we may take this word with us and we will learn more about the sanctuary in our life. It's my wish and prayer. Amen.